a little bit more comfortable. Proverbs chapter number 22. Here we go as we just continue right on in our march through the book of Proverbs. And uh, the great thing about Proverbs uh, is, is the fact that just every verse that you come to is just, you know, a nugget all to itself and contains something for our consideration. And and uh, it's always something of uh, practical value that, uh, you know, you might not find somewhere else in the Bible. You go way back in the Old Testament and you might... Uh, be talking about genealogies or you might be talking about something related to history and uh, things of that nature but boy when you when you come to proverbs it it just gets down well like the old timer said where the rubber meets the road right down where you live and so tonight we pick up in verse number eight we got down through verse seven uh, in our last study so tonight we begin in verse number eight He that soweth iniquity shall reap vanity, and the rod of his anger shall fail. Now, here again, as we see so often, we have a reminder of the law of sowing and reaping. The Bible says again and again that whatever we we sow, that's what we're going to reap. We reap what we sow. We reap more than we sow. We reap later than we sow, but there's always a harvest. And that's true whether you're talking about planting uh, corn or, or whatever it is. In other words, our choices have consequences. Our decisions determine our destiny. So whatever happens tomorrow is going to depend upon the decisions that we make today. And the point of this is that, notice he says, He that soweth iniquity shall reap vanity. That word vanity uh, uh, is a word you might use to speak about uh, vapor or uh, a soap bubble. Nothing is is the meaning there. Uh, They sow iniquity and they they reap nothing. Now, whenever I say they reap nothing, I'm talking about they reap nothing of profit. They gain nothing by it. They... They certainly do reap something, but it is of a, a different nature. And uh, the, the last part of this proverb here is referring to the, the person's effort to harm other people, and the rod of his anger shall, shall fail. In other words, the evil that he intends to bring upon someone else results in his own loss rather than his good. I recently read a story that I thought was a great illustration of what this is talking about. There was a fellow that had been, was looking for a job, and a job opened up, and it was one that he really wanted badly, and uh, and uh, he, he knew his competition for the job. He'd worked with uh, with nearly all of the other applicants there in other places, and in his mind, he was better than they were, and so... He sat down for the interview, and uh, in doing so, he made sure that he commented on each one of them, you know, Joe and Bill and Bob, whoever it was, and he commented on each one and, and shared with the person doing the interview all of the mistakes that he knew about, all of their shortcomings, and just the bottom line is he just insulted all of these other guys and continually compared himself to them and how much better that he would uh, uh, that he would be qualified for the job. So uh, he he left the interview as he struts out, really feeling good about himself. He's put it all out on the table. You know how could they choose anyone else? And he went out and he celebrated with a drink and uh, and started the waiting process. Just figured whether well, they're going to call any time, but the phone never did ring. And, and uh, you know, the days just kept going by. Nobody contacted him. He couldn't figure it out because he's sure that he's going to get that job. Well, finally, he calls them. And, they, you know, they're even reluctant. They just says the position has failed, and he wants to know why. And so he just keeps badgering them, and finally they just they told him. They said, we, we don't need someone working for us who is so quick to stab others in the back 
and to insult them and discredit them and slander them, you're just not right for the position that we're looking for. So here is a guy that, you know, he thought by putting others down, he could lift himself up. And the result was that he lost the job that no doubt he was qualified for. And uh, we need to remember that whenever we, whenever we do wrong to others, we ultimately do wrong to ourselves. In other words, if we, if we seek to hurt them, we end up hurting ourselves. Uh, there's one of the Proverbs, I can't remember exactly where it's at, but it talks about the danger of rolling a stone upon someone else, and the, the picture is somebody that's waiting in ambush, and, uh, and they've got this boulder there, and they're just waiting till, till, till their enemy, whoever it is, comes by, and they're gonna push this boulder off and roll the stone on the person and destroy the person. And the warning of the proverb is, he that would roll a stone upon another, it shall roll back on him and destroy him. And that is certainly so true. And that is the very point that's being made here. Somebody says, well, boy, they did me wrong and I'm going to get even. Oh, no, you won't get even. You never will get even. Believe me, it's going to cost you more than you want to pay when you mistreat other people Sooner or later, you're going to reap what you sow, and, and it's like the old saying, sin will will take you further than you want to go, it'll cost you more than you want to pay, and it'll keep you longer than you want to stay. Sin is a horrible thing, and that's the warning here about iniquity. When we sow iniquity, we're going to end up in the non-profit column of life, and so... Let us learn from that proverb that it never pays for us to mistreat someone else, even though it might be that they've mistreated us, they've talked bad about us. And uh, we're, listen, we're, we're not going to make things better by making things difficult for them. That doesn't solve the problem. Uh, you know, the Bible says that the Lord led us to repentance with what? It says, the goodness of God leadeth us to repentance. The word repentance has to do with the change of one's mind that results in a change of our behavior. And so how does God work in our life to change us? Through His goodness. Through His goodness. That's the only way that we are able to make a positive change in the lives of other people by demonstrating goodness toward them. Now, that's, that's interesting because it ties into the next verse. Notice what he says in verse number 9. He that hath a bountiful eye shall be blessed, for he giveth of his bread to the poor. Here, here is a picture of the, the blessings of benevolence. There's an old German proverb that says, Charity gives itself rich, covetousness, hoards itself poor. Boy, that is exactly right. And so in the light of of this proverb here and many other promises found in the Bible, you know, it's, it's like I say over and over again, we're always best to ourselves when we're good to others. We're always best to ourselves when we're good to others. By the way, that's what unconditional love is all about. That's the way that God loves us. God doesn't require us to do something in order to love us. Now, look, that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that if, if we have sin in our life, it doesn't mean God's pleased with what we do, but it means that God loves us in spite of what we do. It doesn't mean that God won't deal at times harshly with us because of what we do. But when he does, it'll be an expression of his love with the hope that is going to result in a change in our life. So whenever we deprive someone else of their needs, what do we do? We end up depriving ourselves. And here we see there's a rich reward for those that are generous toward others. I read something several years ago. I don't know who wrote it. But as soon as I read it, I jotted it down in my Bible over in Second Corinthians chapter number 9 where it's talking about more blessed to give than to receive. 
But, but this is what it says. It says, we must learn to give of our luxuries to supply the comforts of others, our comforts to supply their necessities, and even our necessities to supply their extremities. So, you know, the point is that we haven't really given sacrificially until we get to this last part, that that is, in, in the giving of our necessities. In other words, we, we, we give to meet the needs of, of the other. We deprive ourselves of our needs so someone else won't be deprived of their needs. The point is, sacrifice costs something. It requires something of us. Uh, you know, it's possible to, for, for some people to be able to give something and it really doesn't cost them anything. I, I'm, I mean, let's face it, there are a lot of these very wealthy people that, that give and they actually profit from it because maybe it's a tax write-off. I mean, there's so many loopholes today, and believe me, they know how to play the game, and as a result, you know, you read about some professional ball player, maybe they gave a million dollars to to this charity or that charity, you know, and think, wow, that is so wonderful. Well, they really, they really didn't, they didn't give up a thing in order to do that. They actually gained as a result of it. So when we talk about making sacrifices for God, understand that when we make a sacrifice, it means that we are giving up something ourselves. It costs us. Most most of the giving is out of abundance rather than 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 you know out of the things that we actually need. And by that I mean we we give, but it's out of our abundance and we we have plenty left. You know, there are several examples in the Bible of those that gave all. Take the poor widow, and she gave all she had. I mean, that was it. Uh, and uh, I, I think about, you know, whenever uh, the woman anointed our Lord and poured out the precious ointment. And here you've got the disciples griping about it. They said, why was this waste made? So my, we could have, we could have used that. We could have, you know, we could have sold it and given that to the poor. And she poured it all out. She didn't hold anything back. And, 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 you know, we need to just stop and ask ourselves, how much are we willing to deprive ourselves for the sake of being a blessing and a help to other people? And, 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 and I'm afraid that a lot of times what we do is to think in terms of how little we can give and get by with rather than how much can I give. You know, we we go into a restaurant, we eat a meal, we look at the bill, and that's $28.95, you know. So we start calculating now, okay, 20, you know, 20%, well, 10% is going to be $2.80, that's $5.60, you know, and uh, well, I'll be generous. Today. I'll just round it off to six dollars, and 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 a lot of missionary comes by, and 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 I, I'm afraid there's too many times that we think in terms of how little can I get by with giving, rather than how much can I give, and 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 we get it backwards. And what happens is we deprive ourselves whenever we hold back. And boy, whenever you think about the Lord and, and the giving of himself for us, think about that. He didn't hold anything back, did he? I remember years ago preaching a sermon on that on that little that little statement talking about the Lord, you know, whenever he's in the garden, he said, he went a little further. He went a little further into the garden. Well, I, you know, I took that phrase and I just applied it to the whole of his life and uh, the sacrifice that he made and you just look at his life and every step that he took he went here but but he went a little further than that it was never doing just enough to get by it was always going the extra mile you, you remember what the lord said about going the extra mile raise your hand you know okay the Lord said, if a man compels thee to go a mile, go with him twain. That is two. Go the extra mile. And in case you're not familiar with uh, 
what he was talking about. In those days, uh, it was a law that, you know, the Roman soldiers could come by and they've got their big old backpack on all of their supplies and they despised the Jews and they would come by and, and say to the Jew, here, you dirty dog, you know, take and carry my backpack for me. And uh, so the, he'd have to pick it up. Remember, remember, they're under the iron heel of the Roman government. They were given certain liberties, but the Roman government was the controlling factor, and they could put the clamps on any time they wanted to. And so here you got this Jew uh, that that he maybe he was in the middle of a project or farming or whatever, and he has to stop what he's doing and carry this soldier's backpack. But there was there was a law that was enacted in order to, you know, somewhat uh, uh, protect the Jews and uh, certainly to appease their wrath. And so they made this law that uh, all, you have to do, all he has to do is take one mile. And, and, and some suggested, some historians and what have you, that some of those Jews, they, they knowing that law, They actually went out and measured off a mile, 5,280 feet. So you can just see them, boy, they're stepping it off, and they get down there to the mile marker, and they drive a peg in the ground. That's the mile marker from their house. So here they are. They're out there working. A Roman soldier comes by. Here, you dirty dog, carry my pack for me. Jew picks it up. He starts down the road. He gets to that mile marker, that's the limit of his responsibility according to the law. And he takes it off and sets it down and says, there you go, sir. That's all I've got to do. And the Lord said, when someone compels you to go one mile, he said, go two. Go the extra mile. How seldom do we do that in our lives? It's usually the things that we do are usually done just to get by as easy, as cheap as we possibly can so we don't have to inconvenience ourselves and we can get on with what we want to do, you see. We can get back to, uh, to, to living for self. And, and so the principle here, and as I, as I started out saying, this is the blessing of benevolence. He that hath a bountiful eye shall be blessed. You want to be blessed to the Lord? Well, then we need to look upon the needs of others as being our needs and respond to those needs as generously as we possibly can. Now, verse number 10. There's somewhat a change here in our in the thought of this verse. Cast out the scorner and contention shall go out. Yea, strife and reproach shall cease. I don't know about you, but the older I get, the more I dislike strife, contention, fussing, fight. Whenever I was a young preacher, I I don't know, it was some, I had some warped way of looking at it. It's like I almost enjoyed a good fuss or fight, you know. I didn't bother me at all. Boy, I could just tangle with a bunch of deacons or whatever it was. Didn't make me any difference and go home, sleep like a baby. They didn't, they didn't, didn't bother me. But the older I get, the less I like contention. I, it just, because most of the time it's so needless. Uh, the strife and the fussing and the fighting. And notice here he's talking about the scorner and and, and contention. And uh, now this is going to really sound weird to some of you because here I am a pastor. And as a pastor, uh, you know, I want to see the church grow. I want to see uh, the membership grow, get more and more people in the church. And so... Uh, this might seem a little bit weird, but give me time to explain what I'm talking about. I think sometimes uh, we're too concerned about keeping all of our church members. You know, we don't lose any church members. Well, maybe we do, maybe we don't. In an ideal church, wouldn't it be great if there was, you know, if, if such a thing existed? The ideal church, and all of the members would be 
as nearly as perfect as possible, uh, be hardworking. I mean, all of the members would be actively involved. Everybody would be doing something. They'd be generous. You wouldn't have to beg them to give or anything. They would just, oh, they would just love to give and to help any way they can. They'd be kind. Wouldn't be no fussing and fighting. Everybody would be kind. They'd be cheerful. I, you know, I'm amazed how we Baptists just, we just don't put any real emphasis at all on the importance of joy. You know, if somebody took a little nip after work and we found out, man, we want to ride him out of town on a rail, how awful and how terrible that is. Or we heard him say a cuss word, how awful that is. But you, you, you can, you can let people, you know, act like they just drank a bottle of strychnine and they look like the skull and crossbones, look like death warmed over. They never laugh. They're never excited. They're never joyful. And we think, boy, you know, they're, they're a great Christian. Well, the Bible says the joy of the Lord is your strength. And joy is extremely important in our Christian life and in the ideal church. The members would all be cheerful, hard-working, generous, and all of these things I've mentioned. There would be absolute harmony in the ideal church. Nobody would ever do anything to harm the church's mission. You know, their philosophy would be that if it's for the good of the church, I'm willing to do it. I'm not going to rebel against authority. I'm not going to do anything that will be destructive or detrimental to the church whatsoever. And uh, that'd be ideal. But it's not that always that way. There are times when there are members of churches that are rebellious against the church. They have a destructive attitude. They are unrepentant. There is open sin in their life. They do things that bring shame and reproach upon the church. And then they become a danger to the church. Now notice who he's talking about here. He's talking about a scorner. What is a scorner? Well, you, you, you might say the scorner is somebody that is a smart aleck for one thing. He, he, he's a cynic. He's, uh, he's somebody that's got a know-it-all attitude. You can't tell me anything. He's conceited. He's self-opinionated. And, uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of like that old saying, my, my mind's made up, don't confuse me with the facts. And that, that's the way this guy is here. He, he, he is a scorner. And notice he says, and, and contention shall go out. You cast out the scorner and contention will go out. Now mark it down. When you have someone that is conceited like that, somebody that is a, that is a scorner by definition, and you've got somebody like that in the church, you mark it down, you're going to have contention. There's going to be contention. There are going to be hard feelings. There's going to be fussing and fighting among the membership. And I can't even begin to tell you how dangerous that is. In fact, in fact, whenever you get right down to it, that's, that's what Paul's letter to the church at Corinth is all about. We've been talking about and studying 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that has to do with the, with the matter of love. And, and as he's writing to that church, it's for the purpose of correcting the problems in the church. And the problem was those people were so filled with pride that they were arguing amongst themselves who was the best and who was the smartest and, and, and on and on. So there were all of these divisions in the church. And, uh, and Paul finally, I think, certainly led by the Holy Spirit, but I think in a spirit of frustration said, he said, you're, I couldn't speak unto you as, you know, mature adults. He said, I had to speak unto you as babes. He said, I had to give you the milk of the word instead of the meat of the word. You, you, you can't understand it. He said, there's envy and strife among you. And let me tell you, the Bible, well, let me change that. The book of Proverbs has a lot to say about the scorner. And in fact, I, five or six, seven, I don't know, years ago, something like that, I had an entire message about the scorner and just, just in the book of Proverbs. 
And uh, in Proverbs, let me just give you an example of what I'm talking about. Chapter 1, verse 22. Now, I'm not going to read all of these. I'm just going to tell you what Solomon says about the scorner. And, and there in that verse, he says, they delight in scorning. In other words, they enjoy criticizing other people. You ever met anybody like that? Sure you have. You've met people, and, 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 you, and it's just like they get a thrill out of putting everybody else down. They love to criticize other people. If they didn't love it, they wouldn't do it. Chapter 2, verse 24 tells us that the scorner is driven by pride. You, know, you see, it's the pride that makes him think that he is better than anybody else. It's that, that pride that thinks that, you know, that he ought to be allowed to get by with it. Chapter 13, verse 10 tells us the scorner destroys relationships. Now, I don't look, I don't, whether it is in your family or the church or wherever it is, the Bible says only by pride comes contention. And there's nothing that will ruin a marriage or a family or a church any quicker than pride. Thinking that we are better than somebody else, it will destroy our relationships. And then we find in chapter 13, verse 1, and again in chapter 15, that the scorner despises instruction. And nobody's going to tell me what to do. Well, I don't care what that preacher says. You know, you know, tell me what to do is like several years ago over in the building, I preached a message about gossip. And whenever I was leaving the building, one of the women, uh, not not here, by the way, in case you're wondering, one of the women came up to me and said, Brother Sloan, I don't care how much you preach against gossip, you're never going to stop uh, stop all of us women from gossiping. And right, the first thing I want to do is slap her, and I knew I couldn't do that. But I thought, you know, she's really she's really got a good point. Because when people are, when their heart is lifted up with pride, you can't tell them anything. And that's what he says about the scorner. They despise instructions. They, you know, they're not going to listen to what you have to say. Now, let's go back to, to what he tells us here. Notice what he says. Cast out the scorner. Notice it does not say, be hopeful that he leaves. Right? Cast out the scorner and contention shall go out. Let me, let me tell you, the, the church is so very important. It's more important than I am. It's more important than any of us. And sin is always a threat to the church. Whatever we do, you know, that, that's... That's why the Bible speaks about the church as being a body. First Corinthians chapter 12 likens the church to a body, and a body's made up of different members. And as you know, if I was out doing some carpentry work or something, and I, I hit my thumb with, with, with a hammer, it's not just my thumb hurts. I hurt all over. It affects my whole body, you see. Whatever one member does, it affects all of the members. And the same thing's true in a church. What you do or what I do as a member of this church has an effect for good or bad on the entire church. When Paul was writing to the church at Corinth, there was a situation, and I'll be brief with this, but there was a man, one of the members, living in immorality in the church, and Paul tells them in no uncertain terms, this guy's got to go. Now, when we describe this, we, we, you know, sometimes we use the phrase church discipline, or maybe we use the word excommunicate. That is, we cut someone off. Generally, when people hear that first thing, they think that means you kick them out. Well, not exactly. What it means is that, that the church has the responsibility to discipline those members that are a threat to it. It's not an act of punishment like some people have said. It, it's not like, oh, you did something wrong, you're a member of the church, we're going to get even, you're, we're going to punish you, we're going to kick you out, we don't want you around. The whole idea is to correct them 
in order to restore them. That, that's the point of church discipline. It's like whenever you, whenever you spank your kids, whenever you spank your, your children, it's not that you're wanting to hurt them. Well, you did wrong. I'm going to hurt you bad. No. The idea is that you need to be taught a lesson for your own good. You need to be taught a lesson that you might correct your behavior. And there comes a time when it is absolutely necessary for churches, if they're going to survive, there comes a time whenever the church has to take action against the scorner. Because here's somebody that is dead set on sin. They don't care who gets hurt. They're not going to listen to instruction. They're not going to pay any attention to anything the pastor or the Sunday school teacher says. You can't correct them. You can't change them. And for the sake of the church, for the sake of the church, they have to be put out, as it were. That is, they lose their privileges of membership. And hopefully, that will awaken them to the seriousness of their sin and cause them to repent and to get back in fellowship with the Lord. So, let me sum this up. The Bible, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, it says, uh, evil communication, and it's using the word communication not in the sense that we do of talk, but it has to do with the company that we keep. Evil communication corrupts good manners. Uh, in, in other words, uh, who you hang out with, the friends that you keep, will have an effect on you. Used to be an old circuit riding preacher many years ago with the name of Sam Jones. And old Sam said, if you lay down with the dogs, you'll get up with the fleas. That's right. I'm telling you, the company you keep is going to have an effect on the life that you live. And there comes a time for your own sake that you've got to separate yourself from the ways of the world and, and live your life in fellowship with God's people. Amen? Because, listen, I'm telling you, they're the greatest people on the face of the earth. They're not perfect. They're not perfect. But they want to be. They want to be. Well, we're going to cut it off right there. And Lord willing, next week we'll pick up in the next verse. And I just hope something tonight has been of a help to you or reminded you of... of uh, of something that's important in your life. Any comment before we go?